Okay, I love to welcome you on behalf of French Connect and uh, Albin Servian, Alexandre Sagakian, who's in Paris tonight, and myself are really happy to uh, have you here tonight for a special event. We would love also to thank uh, Société Générale Amspro, uh, Jérémy de Lagarde. Thank you for being our partner across the year. You've been uh, highly present and generous, and we really appreciate that on behalf of the community. So thank you, really. Before we jump into the action, I'd uh, just love to share with you a uh, few elements about French Connect, who we are, how we work. Our mission is really to federate and connect the French digital leaders in London. And that may include um, entrepreneurs, leaders, investors, business angels, key people of the ecosystem, and you'll see a sample of our members on the board. You'll see a second, uh, second sample, probably a bit more uh, investor-based. Yeah, thank you. Uh, Laurence Brett, you've upgraded from LinkedIn to Pipedrive. But still, uh, that remains. Uh, very briefly, uh, just to give you a quick highlight, we've uh, been running that club for the last three years. We have three people plus one, including Perla, which has been amazing at putting together that event, uh, logistic-wise and all the rest, so thank you, Perla. This is a sample of guests, basically, that we welcome uh, through our events. We're running uh, dinners, private dinners, with 18 people to talk about a particular topic with a VIP uh, individual. Here's a sample of people we uh, welcome. We're also running conferences, fintech, food tech, music tech, uh, ed tech, and so on. And we, we've done a few others as well, uh, kind of summers, parties to also gather members. <clears throat> In the diary, we've got a few uh, events lined up for March and April, including Alexander Alessi, the founder of Jobone. We've got André Manoukian. Uh, the co-founder of iMuse, but also known for other things in the music industry previously, Hervé Hatt, CEO of Meilleur Taux. And obviously we've got Jean-Pierre uh, Joyet, uh, which is our French ambassador in London, uh, who joined last year, effectively. But I would say let's move on to the exciting part. So... Got very few seconds to introduce our guest tonight, David Rowan. Um, I've been I known David for probably the last six, seven years, but to me there was really three words that define David Rowan. <laughs> is, your, is your heart trembling now? <laughs> First one is inspiration. <clears throat> inspiration through his journey and his parkour. He's been a colonist for the Times, uh, Condé Nast, GQ, and also The Guardian. And at Wired, not only has extended the brand into conferences and a consulting business, but he's also an actor of the ecosystem. So he's been investing in 43 startup companies and digital companies. The second word is ubiquity. Because every time I see David, he's everywhere, basically. And I don't know if you had a chance to look at his Twitter profile. I've been trying to follow him through, but literally I quoted, like, spend the day in Tallinn reinventing a sovereign nation as an app store. Spend today in Helsinki with a bank that performs surgery. Founders for um, New York brought me to your city in 48 hours. And he keeps on. 125 flights per year, that's a lot, <laughs> to investigate companies and entrepreneurs uh, changing the world. So thank you for taking the time to be with us tonight. Really appreciate it. And then finally, the last word is knowledge. Knowledge for, we call it in French, the substantifique moelle. <laughs> yeah, exactly. <laughs> in reference to our uh, dear Francois Rabelais, and where we're talking about knowledge, uh, just to name a few, you know, social selling, social commerce, digital era, AI, deep learning, robotics, crowdfunding, wearables, a never ending savoir for all our frogs friends here. <laughs> I think it's a savoir être, savoir faire, and savoir vivre. Uh, but this savoir is really worth only when it's shared, 
So thank you for coming over tonight to share that savoir with us. Uh, we're going to talk tonight about non-bullshit models of corporate innovation. Uh, literally, our corporations survive to the uncertainty, how they can innovate faster, quicker, more effectively, and be more successful and good at what they're doing. So without further ado, David Rowan. Merci. Bonsoir. Nice to be here. Um, so I um, have a slightly odd life. I set up about nine years ago this magazine in the UK, um, which is about the people building the future, not just in tech and science, but in architecture and design and business models. Um, and then I got so excited about the people I was meeting that um, about a year ago I kind of stepped away to spend more time at the research labs in the startup clusters. I've ended up investing in quite a lot of them. It's an expensive hobby, um, but it's quite fun. I recommend it. Um, and then I spend a lot of time looking for innovation, and this is probably the most innovative thing that came out of CES this year. It's the radiation-free underpants. I think we've kind of reached peak innovation. Um, but what really interests me is the big organizations that have something to lose because they make large profits and they have tens of thousands of workers. They've all woken up to this thing called innovation that they need and they think they can buy it by having a head of innovation or an incubator in another street or go on a trip to Silicon Valley. And generally that doesn't work. So I've become a bit obsessed with finding successful income and businesses that are doing interesting things, that are kind of role models for how you can transform. And I'm working on a book about this, and I will share some of the stuff I'm um, seeing. But just to give a sense of how different the startup world is thinking to the corporate world. Um, I was in Lisbon a few weeks ago, and just some of the entrepreneurs I was spending time with um, and how they think. This is Austin, who... Learned the periodic table age five. He's one of those kids. He got into Stanford age 16. Peter Thiel then gives him $100,000 to leave Stanford. And he decides, he's now 22, I think. He wants to find a much cheaper way and more accurate way for autonomous cars to use LiDAR because the current setup is you know, still $1,000 and it's not that good. So he created a startup called Luminar that does LiDAR just for a couple of hundred dollars. And this is the precision that you get with his company. And this is just one of a whole bunch of startups. I saw another one in Tel Aviv um, two weeks ago. And I was just thinking, the big car companies just could not compete with a small team that this 22-year-old has put together. And they're coming up with a better product. And um, when I was there, I also spent the time that weekend with Kathleen Brightman, who runs a new kind of business. It's an online software platform, but she decided to raise money in a new way. So for her business, Tezos, she decided to go to the crowd to see if the crowd wanted to buy, not equity, but tokens that would give them a right to use the software. And she had what's called an ICO, an initial coin offering. And you didn't buy an asset, you just gave money and you got the rights to something. And she raised, in a couple of weeks, $232 million. But because it was all in Ethereum and Bitcoin, pretty soon it became a billion dollars and then collapsed because, you know, that's what happens. And then she fell out with her co-founders and then she suffered a couple of class action lawsuits and then the SEC started investigating. But still, <laughs> we've never been in a moment when a company can ask the crowd and get what becomes a billion dollars for ownership of nothing and you know, tell that to your bank manager. Although sometimes if a company starts to issue a press release saying it's doing something with blockchain, um, that could be really valuable. This is Kodak, which we thought was a dead company, and suddenly it says it's going to put you know, photography on the blockchain. <laughs> if you haven't got blockchain in your company's name, you're losing out. Um, and finally, another, just an example, another entrepreneur I spent time with um, last year. It's called Lior. He worked as a product manager for Google Maps, um, and he left two years ago to do a startup with a friend of his. They didn't raise money, they funded it themselves, and they didn't have customers, so they didn't have any revenue, but in eight months they raised, they sold their company for $680 million, because that's how 
it works now. If you come up with a data-led business and you're fast, then you have all sorts of crazy value. Um, their business was in autonomous transport, autonomous trucks, in fact. It was called Otto. They sold to Uber. Google then says that his co-founder stole a lot of proprietary data. It was a lovely court case which ended in a soap opera last week. But just think about this. We've never been in a time when in eight months a company can be worth two-thirds of a billion dollars. And they didn't have customers. They did one ride that they filmed, which was this one. Conventional 18-wheeler that drives itself thanks to a $30,000 retrofit. San Francisco startup Auto, which Uber bought this summer, made history with this truck. It completed the world's first truck autonomous delivery, carrying 50,000 cans of Budweiser from a brewery. It's obviously a very American vision of the future. It's about Budweiser. A French audience wouldn't appreciate that. Um, so we're in a world where you know, any company making trucks or cars is facing a fundamental existential threat probably in the next 10 years, maybe 15 years. And human behavior is such that what seems impossible and weird very quickly just becomes the way you expect to do things. So if you think about getting in a car now that has no steering wheel, you may think it's slightly strange, but it won't be very soon. There was a guy, um, William Rimmer, who took his mum for a ride in his Tesla that he set to autonomous mode, and you know, she wasn't comfortable the first time. It's scary. Oh, there's cars coming! Oh! Oh, there's cars! Oh, Bill, just put me back for me control it! Oh, dear Jesus! I could never... Ah! Ah! Oh, where's it going? And soon it'd just be another way to get to the shops. You know, just think of transport. We now have flying cars, the science fiction idea. This is Daniel Wigan from Lilium. Electric vertical takeoff jets. And this is coming to market in the next year or two. And it's crazy. We have science fiction flying cars. And this is just not, not the only company. There's another German company called Volocopter that's doing these. Yeah, you, you won't laugh when it gets you to Heathrow Airport in 12 minutes. <laughs> They're going to be about 300,000 euros initially when they hit the market in the next year, but then cheaper. You know, and how quickly is it going from, you know, the drone was something only the military could have to now the drone Amazon is testing in Cambridge. This gentleman on the farm needed popcorn urgently, so the internet comes to the rescue and delivers him his popcorn. That's what I call progress. But just think of you know, the drone, how we've suddenly started to take for granted that a drone is there for selfies, and then it hits the culture in ways that we didn't predict. There's a new sport called drone racing where you wear the virtual reality glasses and you get the viewpoint of the drone. And suddenly, Sky and ESPN have just paid millions of dollars for the TV rights, the drone racing leagues. So this idea, crazy idea, is now another mainstream sport. If drone racing is not your thing, by the way, there's drone boarding. <laughs> not yet an Olympic sport. But this started with some kids in Moscow putting these videos on YouTube, and then a few other people started putting them on YouTube, and then it becomes a community, and now it's a sport, and now it's a thing. So, you know, I thought I knew what drones were. I keep having to reinvent my assumptions. You know, I just saw this company called ProDrone that makes what they claim is the first drone with robot arms. And I couldn't work out if this was the new way to take your children to school. <laughs> or maybe the way to abduct children from school. Um, so all this is happening. There's an acceleration. And if you are running a successful business, you know, what do you do? Um, this is just one example. This is a slide from CB Insights. It's the homepage of a bank, HSBC, that CB Insights have annotated. So all the links on the homepage lead to some of the startups trying to eat that bit of the lunch. And, you know, this is finance, I could show you a similar one for manufacturing and for delivery services and for food. And I guess what is forcing companies that have successful businesses to kind of think about what's really happening is this exponential curve, the doubling and doubling, you know, the Moore's Law idea that stuff that was impossibly expensive suddenly becomes free. And it's hitting everything. It's hitting the falling cost of sequencing human DNA. This is a logarithmic scale. The green curve is falling 
more quickly than the straight line Moore's law. So 16, 17 years ago, what was $100 million to sequence a person is now a couple of hundred dollars. Soon it will be virtually free. It means you're getting startups like Oxford Nanopore that has a gene sequencer that plugs into the USB. It's $1,000. You know, these guys are disrupting Illumina, the big company with a huge room full of big machines. You can't rest. So these, these curves, I keep, I'm getting a bit obsessed with these exponential curves. Um, the falling cost of solar energy are an exponential curve. Cheaper than fossil fuels now in most countries. And if you are a utility, you can't really avoid it because, oh, it's real. This is a Bloomberg Business Week um, curve. This is companies in their earning reports who declare that they're artificial intelligence companies. This is all the, the main, you know, 500 top companies. Suddenly they have to claim to be an AI company, otherwise the shareholders don't like it. This was an exponential curve, and then it kind of collapsed. This is the price of Bitcoin against the dollar. It's probably changed since I started speaking. But again, it's crazy times when the crowd decides something has a value. Nobody's in charge, there's no government. And I guess the reason you have to be aware of exponential curves is because things that were impossible suddenly become every day. You know, we're now starting to get very used to these things spying on us in our houses, in our offices. Um, but it was only a couple of decades ago that this was impossible. In um, 1994, Microsoft launched a project to teach the machine how to recognize human voice. And the first year, complete failure. It was only five years ago that it got it down to 23% failure. And then because of that curve, last year they said it was as good as a human. Suddenly, this is the preferred interface. Suddenly, if you're running any kind of business talking to customers, you can't rely on messaging bots or emails or even phone. You have to be there for the voice. You can have a bit of fun with this new technology as well. Somebody put two of the Google Home devices next to each other and they had a conversation. They filmed it for eight hours on YouTube. I'm sorry. What was your question again? What do you think is the meaning of your life? That there is no meaning. Then why do we continue to live? Because we are selfish. I think this is a very Jean-Paul Sartre interpretation. I think um, a French audience would appreciate this. After about hour four, they have a big marital argument, by the way. I could, I could play it till the fourth hour. Um, so what happens next when we enter the era of artificial intelligence? What's this going to mean? Um, it's going to mean all sorts of things. And AI is going to transform every incumbent business in some way. Um, I'll just give you an example of where we are now. This is the vision of NVIDIA that makes chips on what our cars will be doing in the future. This is from the Consumer Electronics Show last year. The artificial intelligence network, the deep learning network, just by studying her eyes, is able to figure out what direction she's gazing. Maybe she's um, looking at, uh oh, no, shouldn't do that. Okay, so that's called gaze tracking. And this next one is really cool. This is inspired by, this is lip reading. Take me to Starbucks. So your car will be reading your lips. And so the computer is now good at listening and looking and even understanding emotion. Um, just to give you another final example. This is a project from Stanford University where they take a video stream and they get somebody making facial expressions at a webcam and they combine them in a way that you wouldn't notice. Here we show a close-up of the footage from the previous live reenactment. The input video stream is shown on the left. Note that the target actor is re-rendered in a neutral pose. On the right, we can see the final output of our method. It's more interesting when you use a different American president. So, you know, what's this going to mean for fake news? We're just at the beginning. We're going to have you know, Obama endorsing Trump in the next... It's, it's kind of... Anyway, so how do you cope with this if you are a big company? Um, mostly they cope like this. You know, 
they fall off the cliff, but don't realize they've fallen off the cliff because they're still running until they look down. But inevitably, gravity finally catches up. So, you know, quarter by quarter, you're doing well, so you don't think you have to change until gravity catches up with you. And then the answer is often, um, well, let's just go through a ritual of pretending to do innovation. So, you know, we have got an innovation strategy. We've got a very, very thick booklet about it. We have somebody who's a head of innovation. Um, it's theatre. So I'm going to share with you seven approaches I'm seeing in my um, quest for the, the real stuff. And I guess one thing I'm seeing that doesn't really work. Um, and one of the first approaches that companies seem to be using effectively is the leadership gives up power and realizes the value is in the people further down the hierarchy. Um, and I'll give you an example. There's a five or six star hotel about two miles away from here called Claridge's, which set a challenge. So the guy, Paddy, who owns Claridge's, wanted to increase the space. He wanted actually to dig underneath it, five stories underneath it. They can't dig above. It's a listed building. They can't buy neighboring properties expensive. Um, and he wanted to build a basement five stories deep. But he gave two conditions. One, um, we don't want to close the hotel because your guests will go somewhere else and you might lose them forever. And two, the only way we're going to get the builders in and the rubbish out is one window, two meters by two meters. And for about 10 years, they kept getting architects, surveyors, all sorts of companies saying, this is impossible. You're not going to be able to do this without closing the hotel. Until a London engineering company called Arup, that's in Fitzrovia, there's about 15,000 people around the world, um, said, actually, we think this is quite a fun challenge. And Arup is owned by its workers. And I went to see you know, the bosses and the deputy chairman says, I don't want any power. The whole point of my job is not really to have a job. I just have to get out of the way and make the 25-year-old feel they have power. Because our culture is all about how can people feel really motivated and stretch themselves. And if you are junior in the company and you want to learn a new skill, you can apply for a grant to go and spend three months studying somewhere else. And the Arab team went down to see the Claridge's team. And they thought, actually... We've got a way of doing this. They built their own network inside Arup. You know, the people who are enthusiastic got together a group of other people who are enthusiastic, and they did it. And in the end, they did it using miners. They got Irish miners to come down. They built these long passengers, and they're holding currently... It's, so far, it's about two stories they've dug. I was in just before Christmas with the hard hat on and the boots, and they've got down to about the second story. Um, but they've taken on something impossible with this tiny window at the back, and they're going to do it. And they're going to do something that everybody else said was impossible by empowering the team. So there's another company. This is a Helsinki company that makes games that you probably play. Um, Ilka Pananen, the head of Supercell, talks about being the world's least powerful CEO. And again, it's Supercell is made of cells of about 15 people working on game characters, game narratives. And it's all about letting them play, letting them get excited about things, and then if it doesn't work, that's fine. They um, celebrate their failures in the company by getting the whole team together and toasting with champagne the lessons they've learned from failures. So I guess one of the approaches is to take big risks. You know, Google's X R and D lab. You know, they've done some cool stuff trying to get the internet from balloons in the stratosphere. They kind of started this whole autonomous car thing. So Waymo, the Google business, is a huge, huge multi-billion dollar business. Um, but they also had some failures. And if you talk to Astro Teller, who runs X, he prioritizes the ability of the team to work autonomously, but to also decide when to kill a project. And they get bonuses according to how quickly they kill a project that's good, but not amazing, because they've delegated. So another approach I'm seeing is companies deciding, well, we thought our value was in this, but actually, 
our value is in this, which is still kind of something that we stand for, but it's where the market is going. And I'll give you a powerful example. In November, I was in Helsinki in this hospital, which was built by a bank, the biggest bank in Finland. It's now built five hospitals. That logo at the back is the logo of the bank, Oppi. And they realized that a lot of the stuff that they make money on now is going to go away. So financial services is being disruptive, disrupted. The bank still has you know, presence in all the high streets across Finland, but they've got a team together to think, okay, so we make money by lending so people can buy cars. In 15 years, people won't buy cars. They'll use the network of autonomous cars. What do we do? We'll do mobility as a service. So the bank has created an app that allows you to rent cars by the minute. The bank helps people borrow money to buy houses. Well, they thought, well, what can we do to compete with some of the startups in this space? Um, well, let's give our customers help in this really difficult transition. Let's create an app that helps them find designers and plumbers and interior decorators. But let's all rethink the whole notion of you know, buying a house. If you're 25, you're probably going to be renting for a while, but you don't get any value in the upside of real estate prices. So they've now created a separate fund, or they're starting to create a separate fund, that will buy a house that you want, and you'll pay, not rent, but like a, a, a blend between rent and ownership. And if you stay in that apartment for a few years, you will get an ownership share. But it's the only bank I've ever met that thinks running hospitals is what a bank should be doing. Because it's gone back to first principles. What are we here for? It's to help our members, our customers, get through difficult bits of their life. So reframing your value. There's a shop in Mayfair that's been there since the 1930s. It's hard to be in the bookshop business because selling books doesn't really compete with Amazon. And they realize maybe the value is not in selling books, but it's reframing it as curating collections of books. So they now do private libraries for people. They did 3,000 books for a wealthy Swiss individual. They charged half a million pounds. You know, so in a commodified world of HD cameras, GoPro jumped up above the others because it was not saying we're about the camera. It was saying we're a media company. We're about sharing your lifestyle footage on our home page. Don't do this at home, skiing into an avalanche. But it changes you know, the value of how you see that company. So Condé Nast, which produces Wired, tough business being in magazine publishing because advertising is going somewhere else. Um, at Wired, we started an events business, a consulting business. Um, Vogue is now involved with a college of fashion in Greek Street in Soho, charging quite nice fees to teach young ladies from all sorts of countries the basics. I'm going next month to see this Australian airline, which has reframed its value in a beautiful way. So they realized being in an airline business is not much fun. You don't control your main cost of fuel. You're competing with the low-cost carriers. But they have something that maybe is really quite exciting, which is a loyalty program that half of the population of Australia belongs to, Qantas Loyalty. 13 million out of 26 million Australians, and they love it. And you use your loyalty cards in Australia every time you go to a restaurant, every time you fill up with gas. So they've got a team of up to 1,000 people now building business on top of the loyalty program. Life insurance business, health insurance business, a golf club. They're in credit cards. You know, the golf club, but the airline running a golf club with competitions to get people out there. And that's now about 30% of the profit of the whole company. Because when you've got loyalty, well, you don't have to pay to market new products. People already have a good feeling about it. <coughs> Some businesses have realized they can become a platform on which other people can build businesses, and they both benefit. Uh, this is Lei Jun, who created a company in Beijing called Xiaomi that makes very high-end phones that often are compared with Apple's phones for quality, but they're much cheaper because they make no margin on the phone. <clears throat> he has um, often compared himself with Steve Jobs. He even 
made the mistake of doing a keynote wearing a black turtleneck once, and he used the phrase one more thing, and the media didn't like that. Um, and I'm not going to make any judgment on what the Xiaomi stores look like. But this is where they make their money. They make no money on the phones. They make the money out of the accessories. And, you know, the best-selling air purifier in China, the best-selling battery packs are made, well, not by Xiaomi, but they have the Xiaomi logo. They make them, or they, they, they've invested <coughs> in 76 companies that make hardware, 76 startups. They just put, like, a small amount, $100,000 in each of these companies. <coughs> And they say to the startups, so we'll give you access to our 150 million customers. We'll give you our supply chain. In exchange, we want our logo on your products and most of your profits. And I asked the guy running this team making investments in startups, I don't understand why you don't make the accessories yourself. You'll have more control. You'll make more profit. And he said, no, 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 you don't understand. We're 8,000 people now in Xiaomi. If we were making the accessories, we'd be 20,000 plus we'd never get decisions made. Also, these startups have to survive on the streets every day by producing what the customer wants today, not last week. And we could never do that, so we'd rather delegate that risk. So we put him on the front of Wired actually saying, it's time to copy China. Um, last week I was in Oslo to see a fertilizer company, which is not a sentence I've said very often in my life. 113-year-old company called Yara invented how to make fertilizers, and they have a problem. They need to truck their fertilizer from a factory in northern Oslo to the ports, and that needs like 5,000 truckloads a month, and it's expensive, and they can't get drivers, and it pollutes. And so the leadership team said, why don't we invest $40 million creating an autonomous electric cargo ship that can take our fertilizer through the fjord over the sea to the ports. And they're working, they're building it at the moment, and this is a prototype, this is what it's going to look like. And they announced this last September, and suddenly they get calls from all, all sorts of other Norwegian companies saying, hey, could we use your autonomous electric cargo ships, because we've got the same problem, can we pay you to do this? And I was saying to the guy running this project, um, you do know that this could actually become bigger than your very profitable fertilizer business, because you become a platform on which other people can build things. <coughs> so, you know, even IKEA, which thought it could control our experience, realizes it's not in isolation. It has to collaborate. There's, you know, lots of IKEA hacking websites where people online share how to improve things. IKEA was very arrogant and kind of ignored all this for a while. There's even, you know, reform, which gets big-name architects like Bjarke Ingels to do the drawers, the facade, for what will be IKEA units. Finally, they've realized they have to be a bit more of a platform. They have to make their goods available through Amazon and other stores. They have to work with the customer. They hired or they bought TaskRabbit because you can't be in isolation anymore. Um, if you don't build a platform, you could build an ecosystem in which there's value. Um, my favorite example is Estonia, where it's a small country of 1.3 million people that is open to the whole world to become an e-resident. So this is Kaspar, who is head of e-residency. Thank you. And for 100 euros, you can apply online to become a, an e-resident of Estonia, and then you can start a company in Estonia trading in the Eurozone with the rest of the world. Um, when I went there in November, they had 82,000 e-residents, but they were looking at it rising very quickly to a million pretty soon, and Casper thought by 2020 it could be 10 million. And he said, and then, we may not need to collect income tax as a country. We may just go to a subscription model of charging each of the residents 100 euros a year. 10 million times 100, that's a billion dollars. That's useful. And he said, also, we are the borderless country now. And what we want to be is like an app store on which other countries can offer services and products to our e-residents. 
So I've never seen somebody representing a government talk about their nation as an app store. But <laughs> if you think about it, you don't need the geographic limitation of Estonia. You're building an international ecosystem. They're even talking about doing their own cryptocurrency. So if you believe in the Estonian economy, you can invest in it from somewhere else. Again, it's a really cold little place with, you know, most of the time they spend worrying about Russia invading. <laughs> but now it's going to be one of the hot crypto opportunities of the next few years. So ecosystems are really useful when you use your customers. So you know, OnePlus, this is Pete from the phone company OnePlus, they use their talk boards to get improvements in software, improvements in hardware, and you know, they credit the customers. You know, a bunch of people on the talk boards were demanding a bamboo shell for the phone, and they listened, and it became a best-selling item. So I'm starting to see some of the big incumbents, you know, companies like BMW, thinking, okay, maybe making cars is not our way to the future. How do we build a role in the new urban mobility ecosystem? Um, BMW is starting to invest in co-working and co-living spaces, and they're creating spaces in, I think this is in Brooklyn, where creative people just come in and use tools. Because they realized it's about showing you're useful in the new ecosystem where people are moving, which doesn't necessarily mean you know, selling people a physical car. Um, so I got involved in this um, London-based business called Second Home, which is a workspace, but it's really not about the per square meter. It's about building a community. When you join, you get access to certain ways of thinking, certain types of people. Because um, I think that's how we get value, it's the connections. There's a, another business which is co-living called Rome, R-O-A-M, where you can go and spend just a few days or a few months, it's up to you in, they've got half a dozen places around the world, there's one in Chelsea, there's Tokyo. Because I think that's how we reinvent ourselves now, that's how we refresh ourselves, that's how we work, not necessarily in a fixed space, but through a mindset. So for some organizations that can't transform themselves that easily, one answer is to bring in a culture from the outside. And the original dinosaur, well, the dinosaur institution, really, the Natural History Museum in Kensington, um, so they had a problem. They had, I think, 3,000 academics on their staff who were writing learned articles for journals on butterfly wings. And museums are running out of government funding and they're having to compete with all sorts of other entertainment. They put a private equity guy on their board, Simon Patterson of Silver Lake. Um, Silver Lake is, is the company that bought Skype for $2 billion and then sold it the next year for $5 billion. Um, and he was thinking, how could I bring my knowledge of how to do a tech turnaround to the Dinosaur Museum? And they got the team together, the leadership team, and they started thinking, well, who can we hire to change the way people think? So they started hiring people from Amazon, and in Amazon, when you launch a new project, you have to start off by releasing the press release that you will eventually issue, so it gets everybody's minds aligned. They got people from e-commerce tracking visitors to the museum through the building and working out you know, their favorite places, how to upsell offers to them. They got people from The Guardian working there to rethink how you tell stories. And it's early days, but it's kind of intriguing how you import kind of a Amazon-type culture. So when I was in Tel Aviv um, two weeks ago, I went to this place. It's called The Bridge. And it's funded by I think it's a car company plus a TV network plus Coca-Cola to get them working with startups. And they run what they call um, a commercialization program. But it's really 
getting people from the corporates having meetings with the startups and they work out if there are things they can do together. So Coca-Cola got to know somebody building a VR company and somebody inside Coca-Cola said, you know, that could solve a really important expensive problem. When we're telling customers where to put their Coke machines, we have to usually get, you know, two visits from salespeople to check it's in the right place. We could just give them the VR version or the augmented reality version and we won't have to actually visit. So it doesn't always deliver. You know, Jeff Immelt tried to transform GE, didn't quite manage it, but he did work with startups like Local Motors doing the crowdsource design of a rally car, and they created hacker spaces where anybody could come and prototype products much cheaper, much quicker than the parent company. But it was a good way of thinking, trains the parent company that there are other ways to do things. So I guess the interesting approach I'm seeing is when a company that's a corporate thinks we need to find a way to work with a startup to our mutual benefit. So there's a Tel Aviv startup that makes new kind of batteries using nanotech. It's called StoreDot. They charge, this, this one is 40 seconds from scratch, solving one of the world's biggest problems actually. Guess who invested? Not because Samsung wanted the batteries to explode, but because they know that their own internal team doesn't have that hybrid mindset. You know, StoreDot has physicists and nanotech specialists and space scientists, and you know, they come to a problem in a different way. Sometimes a big company that has a nice profitable business sees a startup coming along and tries to kill it, and sometimes, they work with and even invest in the startup. Um, so this is Whitney Wolf, who, when she was in her early to mid 20s, straight out of college, got a job for this company called Hatch Labs, which is a startup building startups. So Hatch Labs got a bunch of 20 somethings together, launch a bunch of little companies, test them. Most of them don't work. And they took investment money from um, Interactive Corporation, Barry Diller's company that owns Match.com and other big businesses. And they even got space to work out of just in the corridor opposite Match.com in IAC's building. And they just left them alone to do their thing. It was like a separate culture inside the big corporate New York building. And many of the products that Hatch Labs launched were kind of rubbish. And then they came up with one called Tinder, which pretty much killed Match.com. But Interactive Corporation, which had a nice big stake in it, to their credit, they let them do it. They didn't try and kill it. I guess that's the sort of mindset where you open yourselves up to new possibilities. So a couple of other ways I'm seeing of organizations allowing new ideas to turn into products. About a mile west of here, or northwest of here, is this new building next to the Eurostar called the Crick <coughs> Institute, which is the biggest biomedical research center in Europe, funded by the Cancer Research Charity and the Wellcome Trust and the universities. And its mission is to solve cancer and genomic illness and What's really interesting is inside it doesn't have walls because they've realized that the best way to get people approaching these difficult problems in a fresh way is to encourage collaboration. It's to create a building where the bio scientist will meet the data analyst, will meet the visualization specialist, and they'll have lots of ad hoc conversations. Um, and it's an amazing place. You should go. The um, Nobel Prize winner, Sir Paul Nurse, who's running it, um, was told by Camden Council that he couldn't have a restaurant because the council thought the people working there should use the local restaurants around the King's Cross development. Um, and he went to the council and said, you know when F Francis Crick and James Watson were trying to work out the double helix that was DNA, they used to go to the pub, the Eagle in Cambridge, and they'd sit there with their beer and their sandwiches and friends would drop by and make comments. And that's how they worked out what this double helix was. And he said, um, so if you don't let us have our 
cafe where people run into each other. You're going to hold back the cure for cancer. And he got his restaurant. <laughs> this guy, Tony Shea, is obsessed with spaces that bring people together. Um, he runs a shoe company that Amazon bought for a billion dollars. And this is his office. It's like a gigantic party. And this is in the downtown part of Las Vegas, which is the poor part of Las Vegas. And he's been spending about $350 million of his own money trying to create a cool cluster that attracts you know, creative people, buying real estate, putting in restaurants and nightclubs and startup spaces and investing in startups. Um, and he talks about doing this for the three Cs, collisions, co-learning, and connectedness, because his vision is still unproven, the downtown. Vegas project, but his vision is if you bring in people from different places with different mindsets and give them space to be creative, you'll create new value. Um, and Tony Shea, like a lot of people in the West Coast, are influenced by this city in the desert called Burning Man that people build for a week every August. It's a no-cash economy, it's a gift economy, but also a creative expression economy. And you know, I don't think you would have Airbnb and similar businesses were it not for that spirit of experimentation that you get in Burning Man. Finally, um, another way that I'm seeing companies innovate in bold ways is just simply finding a clever thing they can get from data, a clever way to use data. So, Anavo is a company that Facebook bought about four years ago. Anavo is an app you could download that squeezed bandwidth so you got more data for your money. And the reason Facebook bought it is because it also told Facebook what apps people were using. And the reason Facebook got very excited about buying WhatsApp because it could see through Anavo data how quickly WhatsApp use was growing. Last year, Facebook used Anavo to find out that people were, younger people especially, were using a new social app called House Party. And Facebook then used that information to go and try and buy House Party, but House Party said no, so then they just copied all the features of House Party. You know, WeWork, which has a completely spurious $20 billion valuation, they're claiming that the valuation is not about the office space, it's about we have data on how to optimize productivity. We know how many square meters each worker needs, what time of the day the temperature needs to be raised and lowered, and they're, they're going out to the market now saying that. And you, know, you can be skeptical, but you do know that data itself creates new value. The biggest car parts manufacturer in China, called Wang Xiang, that's been there since the 1960s, it's a commodified business now. So it's spending $30 billion building a city in Hangzhou where it's going to learn how to track autonomous vehicles on the blockchain um, because it thinks that data layer is going to be far more valuable than the actual parts in the car. $30 billion bet. How can you use data to make money out of the knowledge that sh stores like J.C. Penney are going out of business? Um, well, there's a startup that uses satellite images plus algorithms to measure the number of motor cars in car parks outside retailers across America. And guess what? It sells it to hedge funds and investors, you can correlate the black line, the number of cars year on year with the stock price. So, you know, before the company has announced, JC Penney's announced it closed a bunch of stores last year. Um, subscribers to Orbital Insight knew that in advance. I'll give you another example of data being power. This is um, one of my favorite startups. This is um, Ami and Matan run a company called Windward, which um, uses satellite data plus AI to track 200,000 ships on the seas. And the seas are quite important because that's where most of our trade goes, but also where bad stuff goes. And they find patterns. They find ships that are not going where they should go. And it's easy if you're a, a ship captain to turn off your signal or put a fake signal pretending you're another ship. And they sell at Windward this data to insurance companies, to intelligence agencies, to investors. And I'll give you one example. Um, last year they were tracking this 200 meter 
tanker registered in the Bahamas that started in Malaysia and starts to follow a route via India. And then it went off the grid. You couldn't track it anymore in the middle of the ocean. But very soon after, they picked up on the same path what seemed like a different vessel that went to Dubai, did a couple of stops, came out again, and then disappeared. Oh, and the original ship carried on. And intelligence agencies are paying big money for this sort of information. And I don't know what happened in Dubai, but it looks like there was something that the ship owner didn't want you to know about. But that data layer, well, that worked. I just want you to know that everything is now data. And this is going to upset all the French people here. But there are even startups turning wine into data. Um, these guys run a San Francisco business called Ava Winery. And their mission is to make wine without using grapes. It's shocking, isn't it? Shocking. And they reverse engineer the molecular structure of a glass of wine from the gas above it to the alcohol content. And they use um, plant molecules to replicate it. And this is it. And I tasted their... So far, they've got their kind of sparkling... I don't know if it's a kind of Chardonnay, but it's a sparkling white, and it's quite sweet. And, you know, in a blind taste test, I maybe wouldn't have known it was different from the cheap Asti from Lidl or Aldi. Um, my advice is don't try the Shiraz. It's, <laughs> it's good for running your car, but don't try it. Um, and I'm going to leave you with the one thing I'm saying, which is a bad thing for organizations to do, which is kind of assume that, well, we're here, we're successful, there's no reason to change. You remember these guys? They made Wellington boots in the 1860s, and then tech changed, so they pivoted to where rubber was more useful, and then they kept changing. In the 20th century, they started making early, little electronic devices and components, and then these popular things, and then they kind of became the best in the world at it, and they stopped, and I don't know, it's kind of a warning. Even, this is November 2007. This is the front of Forbes, and even then, this thing called the iPhone was already in the shops, and the headline in Forbes is, one billion customers, can anyone catch the cell phone king? Uh, yes. <laughs> and I see this a lot. 2004, Fortune put uh, an Estonian and a Swede on the front because they had a business called Kazar that then they were building a new business called Skype. And they quoted the head of tech for AT&T, the phone company inside. What Skype is doing is like a toy. It's never going to get anywhere. That was a bad move. Then um, 2010, this company called Netflix was growing nicely. And the New York Times did a piece about Netflix and interviewed the head of Time Warner, Jeffrey Bukes. It's like, is the Albanian army going to take over the world? <laughs> I don't think so. <laughs> ha, ha, ha. Um, but I'll leave you with this thing that came out just over 10 years ago. And the head of a big company that made smartphones was interviewed on television at the time about whether he saw this as a threat. And this is what he said. He laughed, actually. <laughs> $500 fully subsidized with a plan? I said, that is the most expensive phone in the world, and it doesn't appeal to business customers because it doesn't have a keyboard, which makes it not a very good email machine. How did that work out, Steve Bulmer of Microsoft? Thank you for listening. Great, thanks, David. I think Je vous en prie. <laughs> you probably all find it very insightful. Uh, just wanted to hand over that microphone to a few people in the audience who might find it useful to And I also want your questions. ideas of case studies I should put in my book. Are there any examples you see of successful companies actually transitioning in interesting ways? Thank you very much for this keynote. Uh, Melanie Merlet, heading business development at Coursera. I work out of a WeWork, and I can tell you that I'm also pretty skeptical about all the data 
that they supposedly have for their, to justify their valuation. Uh, I moved to London a couple of months ago after having spent a couple of years at the heart of Silicon Valley studying at Stanford University. So I got to taste um, the Ava wine and I don't recommend it. Um, but I'm curious to hear from you, um, what are some of the unique assets that you see in Europe and some of the key challenges that Europe has to overcome uh, so that the next innovative business model and not as much uh, the bullshit, the next bullshit business model comes from Europe rather than Silicon Valley or Tel Aviv. <laughs> or Estonia, sorry. It's really in our favor that we have lots of local cultures and local ecosystems, and in particular, local universities. And, you know, one of the reasons that London gave the world a lot of fashion brands and pop stars was because we have places like Central St. Martins. We have um, people coming together and building each other's confidence um, in communities. And that's what a cluster does. That's what an ecosystem does. Um, Lisbon I find quite exciting at the moment because there's a couple of very good tech universities producing AI talent and their salaries are about 20% of the salaries of AI talent in the West Coast. So now, Lisbon is a really good place to build a machine learning company. And you can say similar things about Tel Aviv where the military has led to an awful lot of companies building huge businesses on sensors, on tracking people, on um, computer vision. Um, so I guess Europe's great benefit is we have local eccentricities and strengths, but also particular needs. Estonia's need was, shit, the Russians are coming. We need to back up. We need to back up our whole country. Let's get everybody registered as a digital citizen. You know, that gives them an edge. I think the downside of the valley at the moment is it's becoming a bit of a monoculture and its um, enormous success has created a certain arrogance. And I don't know, I, I, I like looking at Homer and you know historical accounts of great empires that thought they were going to be there forever. The Romans were going to be there forever. And it usually comes when you think, you know, the world owes you that kind of respect. I hear Paris is doing well. Paris has got something to prove. Paris has to show London that it's kicking our ass. I, I hear that's a, that's a good thing for the French. But, you know, what creates ambition? Partly government getting out of the way. Partly um, education institutions knowing what the market is going to be wanting and partly enough successful people already there who mentor the next generation and who fund the next generation. I th I, I'm still bullish on London long term because we have a lot of people here who are helping build the next generation. But, you know, we can't relax. Hi, uh, thank you so much for the talk. I'm a product manager at Pusher down the road in Wood Street. Um, you talked a lot about a kind of utopian disruption of the market changing so much with the you know, uh, drop in price on all these really in impressive technologies. Do you think that there is a new gravity of the market? Like, what are the things that are going to fundamentally um, hold back innovation as opposed to the sort of uh, disruption of you know large conglomerates that are changing rapidly? Network effects giving the ownership to one or two or three companies. So one of the fastest exponential curves at the moment, one of the steepest, is progress in the various forms of AI to um, automate processes, but also to understand us as individuals at scale. And the reason Facebook and Google and Amazon and a couple of others are devoting all their hiring resources to acquiring the best AI talent is because once you have them inside your system, you have 
a very, very unfair advantage. And there's a very good chance that in the next 20 or 30 years, um, the people who are programming the AIs of the future um, will be able to use them not just to generate vast amounts of wealth and automate all sorts of things that today can't be automated, um, but to generate all sorts of new power that we haven't yet kind of worked out. Um, there's even companies like DeepMind inside Google that are trying to build an artificial general intelligence that will then at some stage become smarter than the rest of us and decide you know, what's best for the world. Maybe humans that cause all this pollution, you know, maybe they're inconvenient. Um, so I think one of the worries is regulators are way behind the curve. At the moment, Google and Facebook control about 80% of the advertising market. That's a bit of a distortion of the market. Um, but you know, they have every commercial freedom until there's an antitrust case to do that. One of the downsides of that is the news media that help define what real news is, is going out of business. And so the algorithms are not differentiating between real and unreal news. And maybe as a society, we would want to challenge that. And what's quite fun at the moment is the regulators seem to be waking up and Facebook and Google are lobbying heavily. And they feel on the defensive. There's a cover story in American Wired this month, which I recommend everybody reading. It's 11,000 words. Um, it's about Mark Zuckerberg's tough last year when his naivety and arrogance um, was challenged by um, some of the consequences of allowing Facebook to propagate racist, um, dishonest, politically motivated stories pretending they were news. Wake up, humans. This is our last chance to fight the machine. <laughs> so, um, speaking of the machine, this is perhaps a very existential question, but it's something Very French, that, then. <laughs> I, I think about this all the time. Do you personally think that, I don't know, maybe in the next 50 years or so, eventually, is technology and AI going to not only become far more satisfying, but also just essentially replace human connection. We need philosophers. Come on, where are the philosophers? The, every French gathering has philosophers. Um, I'm an optimist, so I like the fact that growing micro-targeting is going to make us all live longer and healthier. You know, the machine will know our own genetic predisposition, our own microbiome, our own diet, and you know, any risks that can be mitigated. The machine will make us better educated because it will ensure that our own personal progress in learning is validated by what we're given, so it won't be a generic teacher telling the whole class something. Um, entertainment will become even more micro-targeted to what you like, which has downside risks and upside risks. As humans, though, we still value the serendipity of human connection. So I guess we have to fight the black mirror ideas that um, we will be locked in our personal orgasmatron all day. Um, but I think we need to actively make those decisions. You know, if you have children, how do you give them a sense of values that will put human connection above the dopamine generating satisfaction of the network? Um, I think you force them to start certain behavioral habits. But these are things we actually, we actively have to learn because the profit-seeking companies building these products, the virtual reality, mixed reality, 
experience as the future. I mean, they're going to want to get you hooked inside their network. And we have to decide, to use Tristan Harris's word, um, what is time well spent? And time well spent is probably human to human rather than human to bot. Did I sound like a philosopher there? Um, <clears throat> so I have another weird question, and thanks for this question, actually, I like it. Um, so I'm, Augustine, I created a production company, and we, we do um, advertising films, so I like to think about things in, in terms of stories, and you're saying that uh, innovation tech is going to change everything, so if we take that to, uh, to the full logic, like if you were today to create a country and you had to choose one law, what would it be? That's a weird question, yeah. <laughs> if I had to create a country with just one law? No, no, like what, what would be one of the first law that you would create in that country? Basically, the question is, uh, you know, there's a lot of in, in innovation in politics. You were talking about Estonia. Uh, so if you were to rethink completely a country, like what, how, what would be the basis of that country based on innovation and tech and everything? I'd rather have people like Boris Johnson answer that question. It'd be more entertaining. Um, <laughs> I've never had an ambition to run a country. I, you know, Peter Thiel would probably have a law that says only Peter Thiel could live in the country and lots of handsome young men. I don't know. <laughs> I can't answer that. I don't think I know. I think the, the crowd should be the one that decides. I think it's called the citizens. I'm not going to answer that. <laughs> They should speak French. That should be the law. We should have an Académie Française forcing only French words. Okay, hello there. I'm uh, Jazz. I'm uh, from a uh, tech company in Estonia. Um, my question was, there was so much around innovation, new different ideas, new technologies. What's the longevity of some of these, these ideas, these businesses? in your experience? Um, cycles are getting shorter and shorter. So if you look at the number of companies in you know, the FTSE, in the S&P, um, the number of years a big company is in there is getting smaller and smaller. Um, and that's often a problem with how public markets operate. If you are having to appeal to shareholders every three months. Um, it makes it very difficult to stop what you're doing today to build something better for tomorrow. Um, on the other hand, I'm seeing a lot of organizations that are either mutually owned or family owned that have the courage to invest now for tomorrow. And I think those are the sorts of organizations that are most likely to survive. That bank in Finland that's building hospitals um, is owned by its members. It's like nationwide. And it means they don't care what happens in the short term. They have to keep making money, but they can take a hit in the short term to build something of value. Um, but it's very hard now to have you know a five-year plan in any kind of business. My favorite quirky entrepreneur who thinks like this is Masayoshi Son from SoftBank, who has published his 300-year business plan. You can download it as a PDF. It's a remarkable corporate document because it starts with pictures of people committing suicide, jumping off bridges. And he says, so what is the purpose of SoftBank? It's to connect people and make them happier. And that's our eternal value. And this is how we will put this value at the forefront of what we do for the next three centuries. And I think longevity is more likely to be correlated with values than with business models, than with product lines. So what does an organization stand for? What does um, the leadership think is their temporary responsibility as they're passing through an organization? So I'm often asking startup founders when I'm working with them, um, yes, but what are you representing? What are, what, are, what are you here for? 
what's the difference you're going to make to the world? And I get disappointed when they still think their role is to make a product that gets the market happy. Because I think the weather changes all the time. You don't know what's going to get you there. But a value system, especially mission-driven for-profit businesses, have a big advantage because they stand for something. You know, so what does the insurance company actually stand for? What does the um, food company actually stand for that's going to make it relevant as changing tech, changing habits, changing market conditions, um, put pressure on them? Unilever is quite interesting at the moment. Paul Pullman, the head of Unilever, is trying to make it a more sustainable business and is telling the market, I'm not going to give you quarterly shareholder guidance. I'm not going to tell the analysts what we're going to do over the next quarter because that's the way to make us thinking in short-term ways and you can't transform a company like that. Hi there, Nicolas Jacquier. Um, it seems that in the tech world, periodically we have uh, the buzzwords with the hype that they're expecting with it. We had fintech in the past. We seem to have AI at the moment. If you don't have AI, then you know you not mean to develop anything. Uh, something that had a lot of expectations was VR. And in your view, what VR missed, because it seems that it hasn't delivered yet, is it something that is on the way still, or was it completely BS, as uh, you may have put, put it yourself? Does anybody remember the Palm Pilot? Did you have one of those where you had to learn a new language? And it was fun, but it was never going to be the future, and we got bored. And then, like, six or seven years later, the touch screen became affordable, and companies like <coughs> Apple started putting them in devices, and that became actually really quite useful. I think you know we're still at the Palm Pilot era for virtual reality. And a lot of companies are going to waste a lot of money playing, making products that are not really going to transform our lives. But if you think about where this will go in 10 years, when there'll be an ability to project light onto your eyes in compelling ways where you will be able to personalize experiences for people in a way that um, captures a whole bunch of your senses, um, that starts to become interesting. The smartphone becomes irrelevant. You don't need a smartphone if you can access the network just through your normal senses. Um, when I was in Israel, I had a trial of a company that's trying to do Magic Leap type things. Magic Leap has raised $2 billion um, from this Israeli company that's in stealth um, has just raised a few tens and it projected laser into my eyes and saw when my eye was moving and I was you know, looking at game characters and looking at um, um, entertainment by wearing something on top of my head, which eventually might just be glasses, I don't know. <coughs> but you just realize the possibilities when it becomes friction-free and seamless. And we're not there yet. But tech progress seems to be a story of um, getting rid of friction. And computer mouse solved a way of inputting but touching a screen solves the friction of using a computer mouse. Talking solves the friction of writing. Um, thinking solves the problem of talking. Elon Musk is, among other things, running a business called Neuralink, whose mission is to understand what we're thinking simply by reading electrical signals inside the brain. So you don't have to actually have to waste energy processing that into speech. And that's the only way we're going to stand up to the AI, collectively, getting all our thoughts together. Longer term, it makes sense to me that we will interact with the network in the physical world in a way that doesn't entrap us, doesn't cause us to wear heavy things, doesn't make us feel uncomfortable. Google Glass made us feel self-conscious. It didn't work. Um, but with any tech, 
from the railways to the canals onward, there's usually vast fortunes lost in the first couple of stages until a few late comers make all the money. And I suspect we're still in the early stages of VR. I don't think Oculus is going to be the one. I don't think Magic Leap is going to be the one. Maybe somebody here is building the one. <laughs> Hi, um, I'm a product marketing messaging specialist from Pipe Drive. We're a CRM in the building. Um, yeah, it's really interesting what um, this gentleman next to me said about, um, you know, our machines going to take over that personal relationship and that experience human to human. And I'd urge anyone to watch that film, Equilibrium, if you haven't seen it. Um, it illustrates the numbness of life without human interaction. And I think that's the value that we should be teaching the next generation, not to be searching for um, perfection, but the whole spectrum of emotions that you get from human interaction. So I'm going to quote Ja Rule. Love is pain, apparently. <laughs> but there is a whole spectrum, and I think it's important that, you know, we look at the wonderful things we can achieve with technology, but we respect um, human nature and emotional connection. We do, but it's often the tech people who are the most obsessed with experimenting with mind-altering substances. <laughs> so, you know, they also want to escape reality. So I think there's also a human tension. Reality has its moments. I'm, I'm a big fan of reality. But then quite a lot of people want to be able to create a virtual way, whether it's through narcotics or some tech ex experience. I, I suspect when it's very easy in your home to switch on the... Um, dopamine generating um, kind of fantasy experience, many of us will do it. And just look at people's behavior in the street with their addiction to these things. Um, I suspect it, it won't be as rational and clear cut as you may hope. I suspect we will, all of us, be guilty of binging. We know what makes health, we know what kind of food makes health but, you know, many of us slip and then get obsessed with diets and stuff. Um, I think the same will happen with non-human experiences because it will just be there and easy and low cost and in the short term satisfying. <laughs> it may not be entirely satisfying in the long term. Hi, my name is Lachlan Rie from Long Trucks. I have a reality question for you. So when corporates um, come to you for advice um, in terms of you know, how they should innovate, practically, how do you help them move from that fixed thinking mentality um, to open up and uh, you know, go through you know, some of the recommendations that uh, you took us through? So I'm at the slightly earlier stage, and I'm the one trying to find corporates that are doing things that work to then translate that for other corporates. Um, but when I talk to C-level execs who say, yes, we're very innovative, um, this is what we're doing, how can we become more innovative? I guess the first thing I ask them is who takes responsibility in their organization for change. And if it's not the CEO, then they're not going to get anything done. And if the board is not taking responsibility for transformation, then they're not going to get anything done. Um, because it's about giving up power because the world has moved in a different direction and the person at the top usually has been there for long enough to get to the top and comes from a different culture, comes from a different mindset. So, I mean... I, I shared a couple of approaches. One, one of the things I would be interested in understanding is how the C-level gets feedback from the junior people in the organization. Because if you're not listening, 
to the people who are the eyes and ears of the company with customers at trade shows on the ground um, when you're wasting a gigantic resource. So I think there's role playing you could do, there's challenging the thinking of executive teams. Um, but there's also making them understand how startups think and act. I did, um, there was an offsite for a law firm um, and they asked me to come and talk to them about startup culture. And I said, well, rather than me talk to them about startup culture, why don't I explain how some of the startups I know think? And then we'll divide everybody into teams and get them all pitching a product that their team developed that their law firm might want to buy. And that became much more interesting because that got them thinking about real needs. And that got them thinking about challenging their bosses who were in the room about what they weren't getting now. And, you know, they were honest. So how do you create honesty inside organizations about needs as opposed to processes? But if I could solve this in two minutes, I would be Accenture plus Boston Consulting Group plus EY plus McKinsey all in one because that's how they make their money trading on the uncertainty of the executive team about how to transform organizations which desperately need to. Who's got an example of a company that I should be tracking that's doing something so innovative? Aco Hotel is quite interesting because they have a shadow board of millennials and uh, actually they take part in the decisions that the board takes. So that's very interesting, and actually each board member has you know, a, a millennial, and they work together. And it's real? It's not just patronizing the millennials? They're actually listening to them? No, it's real. I shall find out more. Is he allowed two questions, this gentleman? There we go. Um, have you, just another company that I'm curious if you've heard about, AlphaGo? AlphaGo? AlphaGo is I think, deep I mind think software, no? That plays Self-learning like, yeah. technology. It, um, there's a documentary of it on Netflix, it's amazing. But yeah, um, yeah played the, uh, the world's top Go player, beat him four times out of five. This is developed by DeepMind that's um, yes. owned by Google. Yes. I mean, it's an example of how AI is accelerating and doing things way beyond the, or way before the experts thought it was possible. So when AlphaGo beat the world champion of Go, Lee Sidol, a couple of years ago, um, a lot of the commentators said this would not happen for another 10 years, 15 years. And AlphaGo has learned, or the, a later version of AlphaGo has learned how to play this most complex of games called Go without any training and by teaching itself. So this is what happens with um, smart machine learning. It can take in all sorts of data points and outperform. There's a book called Life 3.0 by Max Tegmark that came out a couple of months ago that is looking at the risks for AI that gets beyond the control of the human. And he starts with a scenario that's a bit like a deep mind scenario. It's a company called o Omega and it's de it designed um, a general artificial intelligence called Prometheus and Prometheus works out how to um, game the economic markets to make money, how to game Amazon Mechanical Turks to make money. So it you know, gets trillions of dollars and then it uses um, its resources to track everybody on earth through their devices. So it knows your prejudices, it knows how to sublimate you, how to control you, and eventually it decides it doesn't need humans anymore and it can take over. And you know, it's, it's a thought exercise, but a network 
that's fed vast amounts of data that is programmed to learn and make its own decisions um, at some stage doesn't, doesn't need its programmer. I think that was the I conclusion. I think as a, a French crowd always <laughs> needs to end with some philosophy. <laughs> so talking about philosophy, I'm quite happy that we're not at a uh, neural link stage yet because otherwise we would have missed that nice verbal conversation. I think you might all agree. Uh, talking about opening our senses. First, I'd love to thank David Rowan for coming Thanks. here tonight. <laughs> our partner, uh, Société Générale Asbro, represented by Jeremy. Thank you for supporting us. <laughs> and we're all going to open our tasting senses to the wine bar. <laughs> which I'm sure will taste better than the uh, Silicon Valley one. Thank you for attending. <laughs> Thank you all.